Welcome to Smoke-Free Housing Strategies, a presentation by the NYC Coalition for a Smoke-Free City. My name is Dan Ferris, and I'm the Policy and Research Analyst with the Coalition. Today, I'll begin by briefly introducing the Coalition and our work around smoke-free housing. Then, you'll have a chance to hear from three of our partner organizations. The Community Service Society of New York will present their Residence Guide to Smoke-Free Housing. Then, Asian Americans for Equality will present a case study on their experience taking two of their residential buildings smoke-free. Finally, the New York Public Interest Research Group will suggest strategies on integrating these new materials into community education efforts. The Coalition for a Smoke-Free City is a program of public health solutions, a New York City-based not public health nonprofit. We partner with community organizations and key stakeholders to support local efforts for effective and long-term change in all five boroughs. We believe that every New Yorker has the right to breathe clean, smoke-free air where they live, work, and play, and that it is unacceptable for our youth to be lured into a life of tobacco addiction. We also believe that every smoker deserves the support and resources to quit successfully. Our three main areas of focus are increasing smoke-free environments to reduce exposure to secondhand smoke, reducing youth exposure to tobacco marketing at the point of sale, and encouraging voluntary adoption of smoke-free building policies. To help achieve our goals, we work with local organizations and stakeholders. This includes creating new content, sharing resources, and collaborating on citywide and community events. Content creation and the development of new materials is a major focus of the coalition, which often supports our efforts to generate earned media through op-eds and letters to the editor. Smoking rates in the United States were as high as 50% of men and 30% of women in the 1960s. As the health risks of smoking became better known, rates fell over the following decades but stalled during the 1990s. Early in his first term, Mayor Michael Bloomberg and the NYC Department of Health and Mental Hygiene developed a multi-pronged approach to continue to bring these rates down to historic lows, including tax increases, cessation services, hard-hitting media campaigns, and bold policies such as the Smoke-Free Air Act. Because of this strategy, 1.3 million New Yorkers have successfully quit smoking, and many more have avoided ever starting. However, there is still a lot of work to do. Approximately 14% of New York City adults smoke, as do 19,000 public high school students. With the help of health surveys and data, the coalition is able to focus on neighborhoods and populations that are particularly hardest hit by the tobacco epidemic. To increase smoke-free multi-unit housing options in New York City, the coalition is working with both new and existing partners, including landlords, residents, and tenant organizations. We've created new resources, often in multiple languages, and just in the past couple of years have helped make over 1,500 additional units smoke-free. We also see smoke-free housing as a major social justice issue and believe that everyone, whether you live in luxury housing or subsidized and affordable housing, should have the option to live in an environment where you aren't exposed to secondhand smoke. We're incredibly encouraged by our growing list of partnering housing providers, both private and nonprofit, who are implementing voluntary smoke-free policies. Through a lot of discussion and outreach work, a gap of information was recognized that the Community Service Society and Asian Americans for Equality hope to narrow through the development of two great new resources. The CSS Guide for Residents is an accessible toolkit for any New Yorker who wants to learn more about smoke-free housing. AFI worked with tenants in two of its buildings to go smoke-free, documenting the process in a case study. Again, thank you for your interest in the Coalition in Smoke-Free Housing. I'm now pleased to turn things over to Ariane Slagle, who is the Health Policy Director for the Community Service Society of New York. Hi, this is Ariane Slagle with the Community Service Society, and I'm going to be presenting our Smoke-Free Housing Guide for Residents. This guide grew out of a need for information, which existed out there. You know, when we first started looking at um, information on smoke-free housing, what we really found was a lot of information out there for landlords, a lot for building owners, but there really wasn't anything for tenants. And so our goal really with this guide was to empower New York City residents with information and resources to create healthier homes for themselves by making them free of secondhand smoke. So the guide basically starts out with a little bit of background on secondhand smoke, we talk about the effects on your health, and we know that any amount of secondhand smoke is dangerous. Any amount increases your risk of heart disease, of heart attack or lung cancer, 
um, it's detrimental to children's health. Um, and kids who inhale secondhand smoke are more likely to suffer from ear and lung infections. They're more, they're more likely to get asthma, to die of SIDS. Um, in New York City, more than 200,000 kids are regularly exposed to secondhand smoke in their homes every day. We have this guide here, or a little chart on the right, um, from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which basically breaks down the different components of secondhand smoke. So you can see all the different toxins that are in that air you're breathing. We have ammonia, we have carbon monoxide, there's methane, um, butane, methanol, and this is all on top of nicotine, which is also an insecticide. So there's a lot of toxins here which are in the air that is being breathed um, by families living in um, apartment buildings even if they don't smoke within their homes themselves. So the smoke can you know, travel through the cracks in the floorboards. Um, some buildings have as much as 65% of their air is shared between different apartment, apartment units, which is significant. Um, and these chemicals from secondhand smoke, they can seep into surfaces. You know, they're really difficult to remove and air purifiers really are not enough to get the air clean. Um, so the best way you know, to, to protect your family from secondhand smoke is to eliminate all indoor smoke um, from the building itself, not just in your own apartment. One way that this can be done is to, um, to implement voluntary smoke-free policies, which basically means that every resident agrees not to smoke in their apartment. Um, that's not to say that they can't smoke at all. Um, most voluntary smoke-free policies include information about where outdoor smoking is allowed so people can go outside and smoke in an environment where they're not going to be bothering anybody, where the smoke's not going to be affecting anybody else's breathing or seeping into anybody else's units. Um, so there are short-term approaches to starting a smoke-free housing policy within your apartment. One is to talk to neighbors who smoke and see if you can reach a compromise. Um, you can always raise the issue of going smoke-free to neighbors who you think that might be um, supportive of this idea. If you have neighbors that you've spoken with in the past who've complained about something or, or who have health concerns, and they would probably be the first people to approach. Um, another short-term thing you can do is also just repair the cracks in floorboards, repair any kind of um, compromises in the walls where you might be getting secondhand smoke seeping in and make sure to replace that filter in your air conditioner. Um, so on this slide, we do have some information about legal resources that can be tapped into. Basically, everybody has a right to live in a smoke-free home. So there are certain legal tools you can use. Um, that's not to say that we think that you should always take a legal approach when um, trying to implement a policy, but it is something that is out there. It's something that can be a resource if need be. Um, one piece of legislation is the New York State Clean, Air, Clean Indoor Air Act um, and the New York City Smoke-Free Air Act. And these basically prohibit smoking um, indoors within workplaces. So this means that if you live in a residential building that has a common area, and if your building employs a super or a superintendent to maintain the building, then it's considered a workplace. And this means that smoking within common areas is prohibited. Um, there's also the Federal Fair Housing Act, which for disabled people, which includes people with respiratory problems, um, landlords are required to make reasonable accommodations in rules, policies, practices, or services when such may be necessary to afford a handicapped person equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling unit, including public and common use areas. So basically this means that they have to create, a, uh, they have to provide you with a suitable living space that isn't going to make you, um, isn't going to be detrimental to your health. Um, there's also the New York Real Property Law, which basically um, every lease includes a warranty of habitability, which guarantees that the leased apartment and all spaces shared with other residents are quote unquote fit for human habitation. This actually does not apply to condos, um, which is a little bit different, um, but it does apply to co-ops and um, to regular apartment buildings. Um, so, for renters who want to take action, you should know that you do have the right to voluntarily adopt a smoke-free policy in your own apartment at any time over the course of your lease. Um, if secondhand smoke is affecting your quality of life, if you feel that it, it's affecting your daily activities, it could be effective in some cases to ask your landlord to enforce the warranty of habitability or nuisance clause in your lease. That's not to say that they're gonna be you know, compassionate and actually follow through, but you, you can bring it up and some landlords will try and enforce that. Um, 
if you think your landlord is adopting an unfair policy around smoking, then you should know that your landlord cannot add a smoke-free policy to your lease um, mid-contract unless you agree to the change. So um, your landlord can change your lease if it's up for renewal. Um, landlords aren't allowed to ask renters about whether or not they smoke. Um, they can only evict a tenant if they violate the terms of his or her lease. And um, tenants of buildings with smoke-free policies cannot be evicted simply for being smokers if they have not violated the no smoking indoors policy. So just because you smoke, even if your apartment has a smoke-free policy, it doesn't mean that you can't live there. It just means that you can't smoke within that building. So you can always go outside to smoke. That's fine. You don't actually have to quit, even though there are plenty of resources out there if you do want to quit. Um, so one way to get your landlord on board with this is to grab their attention um, and make your argument for a smoke free policy relevant to, to them. So for a lot of building owners or landlords, this means bring it down to money. <laughs> so let your building owner management know how much more expensive it is to rehabilitate an apartment previously occupied by a smoking tenant. So here we have a chart here that shows how much it costs to um, renovate a non-smoking apartment versus a light smoking and a heavy smoking apartment. And you can see that the non-smoking, the total comes to about $560, whereas the heavy smoking, it's about $3,500. So that's a significant amount. And, and basically, you know, it really depends on how much people smoked, how long they were there, and how much that secondhand smoke has saturated into the walls. We've all seen, you know, walls where they're, they're yellow from so much smoke over time. You know, the carpets get dirty they get stinky, that, that cigarette smell just lingers. And so to clean that out, to make it fresh, costs a lot more than just giving a fresh coat of paint you know, on a non-smoking unit. And landlords can understand that. And I'm sure they can appreciate that as well. Um, so for co-op and condo residents, it's a little bit different. Um, you should know that a co-op owner can request the co-op board of directors um, enforce their warranty of habitability or nuisance clause in co-op bylaws. So it's very similar to tenant leases where they do have those two clauses in their leases. Um, condo contracts do not contain these um, warranties of habitability, but condo owners can bring smoke-related issues to the condo board. Um, co-op and condo owners can suggest that the bylaws be amended to include a smoke-free policy. Basically, this would have to happen with a majority vote. Um, but the bylaws can be changed by the board to make the whole building, including individual apartments, um, smoke-free. Um, so co-op and condo residents should also know that within, that while co-op and condo owners are in charge of their own apartments, they're still governed by the rules in their proprietary leases and in the co-op bylaws. So a co-op board can terminate the lease of any resident who continually breaks the proprietary lease rules or bylaws, and a condo resident who continually fails to comply with the bylaws can be fined or subject to legal action. So there are things that can be done for people who don't want to, you know, play by the rules, so to speak. So a good way to start um, for voluntary smoke free housing policy um, is to just kind of gauge support in your building. So talk to your neighbors, you know, like, like we said before, talk to your neighbors who may have health issues, who you may have heard complaining about smoke in the past. Ask your building management to conduct a survey of residents um, regarding their opinions on secondhand smoke, just to kind of see where people stand. You know, a lot of people might be surprised that, you know, there's a lot of support for this out there. They may not know by looking at people or by, you know, assuming because somebody smokes there that they're, that they're not, um, they're, they don't want to have smoke-free housing. But a lot of people actually smoke out the windows now. They go outside to smoke, and they don't want the smell of cigarette smoke in their own homes, even though they may be smokers. So there may be more support in a building than you might think, and the best way to kind of gauge that is to take a survey. So sample questions that you can include are, do you allow smoking in your apartment? Have you smelled tobacco smoke in your home that's not your own? Are you bothered by secondhand smoke in your home? Would you, be, would you prefer that smoking be prohibited from apartments, you know, et cetera? These are just things that you can use to kind of get a sense of where people stand and to take the first step. Um, so there's other challenges that, to consider when adopting smoke-free housing policies. Um, one is uh, smoking at the entranceway. A lot of people, again, they don't want to smoke in their own, build, their own apartments. If they can't smoke in their own buildings, they go outside. But sometimes they end up smoking directly in the entranceway. 
um, which can also be burdensome for people coming in and out or for people who live above the entranceway who might be getting smoke in their windows. So um, when going smoke-free, a lot of buildings will include um, signs at the entryway to remind residents and guests not to smoke directly in front of the building. People are pretty amenable to these signs. Nobody wants to, really wants to be a nuisance. Um, the other thing that to consider is that restaurants and bars um, that may be in the bottom floor of a building might have patrons who stand outside and smoke and the smoke gets in people's windows. So if that's a concern, always let the, the owner or the manager know that it's affecting the people in the building. If it's your own apartment, you can go down and introduce yourself and let them know. Um, most times the, the bar or restaurant will be happy to tell their patrons to step out from under the windows. They'll ask them to go to the curb. You can always encourage them, you know, with language that you might want them to use or you can provide them with a sign or whatever. And, and most places are pretty amenable. Nobody, like I said, wants to be a nuisance. Um, lastly, we just have a list of resources for people who are interested in voluntary smoke-free housing policies. Um, this includes the NYC Coalition for a Smoke-Free City, which has a great um, source of information out there. Also, Smoke-Free Housing New York, American Cancer Society, um, American Lung Association, FDA, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, um, and we have all the websites listed there too. And that's pretty much it. Um, so coming up next is Doug Lee from uh, Asian Americans for Equality. He'll be talking about um, their own smoke-free housing initiative in New York. Thank you. Hello, my name is Douglas Nam Lei, and I'm the Director of Policy and Leadership Development at Asian Americans for Equality. Asian Americans for Equality is a 39-year-old community development organization that works on a variety of community concerns, everything from community organizing and tenants' rights to affordable housing development and even local economic development and environmental stewardship. Our organization has been a member of the New York City Coalition for Smoke-Free City for a number of years now, and we've really been happy to work with them on a variety of tobacco control strategies because we really see tobacco control as a social justice issue. We know that housing is a really key component of that and that there has been a growing movement for smoke-free housing across the country and in New York State. Federal agencies such as the Centers for Disease Control and the Department of Housing and Urban Development have endorsed smoke-free housing as effective strategies for not only controlling tobacco, but creating a healthy and safe living environment um, in, in our homes. And we're very fortunate that they've actually not only researched and created evidence-based strategies, but developed tools uh, for individuals like us as uh, managers of multifamily housing to actually implement these strategies. And you know, we also see tobacco control as a social justice issue at the end of the day. Um, while considerable ground has been made around expanding smoke-free housing, we understand that there is a, a gap, um, and that gap is between both private ownership and affordable housing. Uh, home ownership models such as condominiums and cooperatives uh, serve more moderate, middle, and upper income families, and in many ways they are the best model to implement these types of policies around smoke-free housing. Homeowners and shareholders have a stake and, a, and a, a real role in terms of developing house rules and other type of agreements in these multifamily situations. But so many low and moderate income families live in affordable housing or rental housing where this kind of board model and, and, and uh, governance model does not exist. So we really took it upon ourselves to see how we in, in our role in the community could, could implement and try out small free housing in this situation of low-income tenants and publicly subsidized housing. Our organization is one that serves Asian Americans citywide and all New Yorkers, um, but of course Asian American communities is our primary base. In New York City, one in every eight New Yorkers, or roughly 14%, are Asian American. And despite the fact that the city as a whole has um, really reduced smoking rates, um, we, we know that the rate actually has remained the same over the past decade among Asian American smokers. And so for us, taking on this issue is really uh, one piece of trying to address that health disparity that still exists in our community. Uh, as a tenants' rights organization, we really just wanted to start from the tenants' perspective. We conducted a focus group that included 16 Chinese tenants who lived in Queens, Manhattan, Brooklyn, uh, to see really what their understanding and interests were around smoke-free housing and how they could give us some insight on how to implement it. Among the 13 participants, none were actually current or former smokers, 
However, um, they all have smokers in their lives, including many of their family members who live with them. And so there really was a connection around smoking and housing. And not surprisingly, because there is so much dialogue around this issue in the community and even in the ethnic and mainstream media, participants were pretty knowledgeable around tobacco use. As we explored in the focus group, we learned that all of our participants were very knowledgeable around the negative health impacts of cigarette smoke and of secondhand smoke. And they were also very articulated around the acknowledgement that cigarette smoke cannot be contained, that cigarette smoke uh, is not only an issue that travels from one apartment build unit to another, but exposure to secondhand smoke within, a, within an individual apartment is a really big health concern. Um, you know, we really wanted to find out for them if they would support smoke-free housing in their policy and get advice of how to best implement it. And they did say that uh, what the majority of the people we spoke with actually did endorse it very highly. Uh, and of particular salience is the issue for individuals who have health, pre-existing health conditions, such as asthma or other respiratory conditions. They, the individuals who we spoke with through the focus group really said that secondhand smoke is a... Uh, uh, not only an issue in terms of exposing these individuals with health concerns to triggers, but also smoke-free housing could be a way to help people who are trying to smoke actually quit. So to get our feet wet implementing smoke-free housing, we took on the policy in two of our buildings. Um, I'll walk through both case studies because they both provide interesting counterpoints to how a um, nonprofit affordable housing organization like ourselves or any other housing developer um, could take this on. The first building is on, was, is on Rivington Street in Manhattan's Lower East Side. Uh, it is eight units, so not a terribly large building, but and it was vacant at implementation. We really saw this as an ideal to try to make this smoke-free housing policy happen um, because we, there were no tenants uh, to deal with in terms of the implementation at the get-go. Um, but the smoke-free housing policy was something that we would implement from the beginning of rent-up um, as we tried to find tenants for this building. So the smoke-free housing policy was written into the lease and the house rules of the building. Uh, as an affordable housing developer, uh, we are bound by federally, state, and locally regulated uh, fair housing and affordable housing lottery policies. And so we had to do the recruitment, do, do the screening, and do the end, of, end selection of tenants as we do with all of our buildings. And our, we actually found that the, the, the presence of a smoke-free policy did not affect our ability to identify and effectively screen applicant tenants. Um, that at this point, we are rented up. Um, and you know, as we screened the tenants, we interviewed dozens and dozens of families. Um, nobody really had an issue with the smoke-free policy in the building. Uh, our key lesson learned is really aligned with our assumption from the beginning that our rent up scenario is the ideal one for implementing such a policy. Um, but now that actually our, ten, our building is occupied, uh, we've had a very positive experience and good feedback as well as full cooperation from all the tenants and everyone is adhering to the smoke-free policy. Our second case study building is on Woodhaven Boulevard in the South Ozone neighborhood of Queens. Uh, the building itself is 10 units, um, so of a similar scale, but at the time that we actually acquired the building and began working in the building, all 10 units were fully occupied, um, both with current smokers and non-smokers. The unique characteristic of this building is that it is a rent-stabilized building. Um, on, rent stabilization is a, a really unique housing protection law in New York State, which I will get into in a little bit. Um, but to give uh, folks some context as we talk about the Woodhaven Boulevard project, uh, rent stabilization is a law that basically protects the terms of a lease and guarantees um, the right of a tenant to renew their lease. Um, it also limits how much a landlord can raise the rent on an annual basis. And so, of course, implementing something like a smoke-free policy in a building uh, is not possible through the lease, um, but we really had to think of other effective strategies. And we found that uh, communication with the tenants and developing a consensus around a voluntary and self-enforcing policy was the best way to implement smoke-free housing in the situation. Um, we had to go through this route. Um, rent stabilization really bound our hands around it. But we also know that whether it's written into the lease or not written into the lease, this process of communication and consensus building is really critical. Um, 
to reinforce this consensus building, we did put up no smoking signs and policy reminders in public places throughout the building, from the lobby to the hallways to the um, laundry room in the basement. And we knew that rent regulation does really create a unique situation for trying to implement smoke-free housing. But we also know that it was important to take on because rent stabilization is a situation that, that covers many, many buildings all across New York City. And unless we and others can make it work, there's really no way for it to be successful in New York City. So to take a step back, uh, rent regulation uh, is a, a legal framework in New York, New York State that protects uh, the rights of tenants to stay in their, in their buildings. Um, it encompasses both rent control, which is slightly older, from the 1930s, and rent stabilization, which was enacted in 1969. Um, at the time that it was enacted, New York City was facing an affordability and a housing crisis. So in order to help, help New Yorkers stay in their homes, um, the state passed rent, rent stabilization laws. However, today we estimate that there are almost a million apartments under rent stabilization. Rent stabilized tenants are protected from sharp rent increases, and, but they're also given the right to retain and renew their leases. So on an annual basis, rents can only go up between one to 4% or whatever is determined for that given year, but tenants have the right to renew. Um, therefore, landlords must keep the same terms and conditions for each expiring lease unless there is a change that's mandated in order to comply with a specific law or regulation or with the tenant's consent. Uh, the tenant's consent is an important factor, but we know that uh, tenant's consent around an individual lease change is very difficult to come by. So in, rent, in situations of rent stabilization, when you're trying to enact uh, smoke-free housing policies, it's really on property owners to consider voluntary adoption. Um, it's really the only way to go of course, as units turn over, one, one tenant leaves, a new tenant comes in, smoke-free policies can be written into the new leases of a building. Um, this is sometimes called grandfathering in. However, um, over, we know that this is not the most effective way to implement smoke-free housing um, because it takes time and is really dependent on the tone turnover of existing tenants in the building. So what have we learned? Through our case study of two buildings, uh, we've seen firsthand that smoke-free housing policies are actually an effective tobacco control strategy and do advance the social justice aims uh, of the movement and of our organization. Smoke-free housing is a privilege, but it should not be a privilege that should be for the few or for those with means that we really strongly believe and smoke-free housing should be accessible to all, particularly to the families that we serve, which include many seniors, low-income families, and individuals with existing health conditions such as asthma. We as a nonprofit affordable housing developer and our peer organizations are really uniquely positioned to lead the charge because we do serve these most vulnerable populations in New York and we as affordable housing owners uh, can actually implement this and make it happen for New York, all New Yorkers regardless of income. So what have we learned um, and what, what comes out of this? Some of our key recommendations are that it actually is feasible to implement smoke-free housing in affordable housing developments. As managers and owners of housing, however, we really found that voluntary adoption can be developed where the regulatory barriers such as rent stabilization exist. And it really spoke to the fact that not only should rent stabilization be a factor in thinking about voluntary policies, but really the spirit of voluntary adoption it should be in everything, um, even if the policies are written into the lease, because at the end of the day, it is about buy-in. You know, we, we understand the concern around tenants' rights. We were founded as a tenants' rights organization, and we know that some landlords who really rely on harassment um, and other types of uh, predatory strategies could use smoke-free policies to force eviction of tenants. But we think that actually majority of landlords will not use these policies, and actually unscrupulous landlords will use whatever it takes to get their tenants out if they want to. Um, so it, enforcement of these policies and protection of tenants' rights are really part and parcel with other issues of tenants' rights protections that we as organizations take on. Our lesson, finally, is that successful imp implementation of housing policy depends on communication and consensus building. In many ways, this was nothing new to us. Um, we work with over a thousand tenants every day, and whether we want to make rehabilitation to their unit, we need to inform them about things that are changing in the building, 
it really is all about communication and consensus building, whether it's something positive or something negative that the tenant will foresee. Tenants need to know how it's happening, why it's happening, and at the end of the day, how the changes that are happening will impact them the most. So I know that any affordable housing developer will know that communication and consensus building are really key to any successful changes in a building. But at the end of the day, it is really also about informing our tenants about the benefits of smoke-free housing in the building and how smoke-free housing not only uh, curtails and prevents sec exposure to secondhand smoke, particularly important for those with health conditions, um, but also enables those who are trying to quit, um, enables them opportunities to not smoke and, and gives them ways to, to, to practice that. For those who are looking for cessation resources, if we are going to implement smoke-free housing policies, we should also be ready and able to connect individual tenants with, uh, with cessation resources. So I hope that you found our case studies helpful. Uh, uh, to move on, I'd like to introduce Megan Ahern from NYPERG, who will now walk us through some strategies for using these new materials in community education and outreach work. Thanks, Douglas. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Ahern, and I'm the program coordinator for the New York Public Interest Research Group, or NYPERG. And NYPERG is a proud member of the New York City Coalition for a Smoke-Free City. Today, I'm going to share some of the best uses and best practices for integrating smoke-free housing materials into both existing and new community education efforts. Uh, the smoke-free housing materials we'll speak about include Community Service Society, or CSSs, smoke-free housing guide for New York City residents. The pamphlet is the first one of its kind focusing on providing information that wasn't previously accessible to tenants. It also clears up common misconceptions and some misinformation that we've encountered. And then secondly, uh, the Asian Americans for Equality, or AFI's Making Room to Breathe case study, which documents the process of going smoke-free in two buildings. And in addition to new content that CSS and AFI created, the practices we'll go over today also apply to resources that you may have already, such as the Impact of Secondhand Smoke infographic and the Smoke-Free Housing fact sheets, along with anything else that your organization may have made. Creating new materials is an effective tactic because first, it strengthens our reputation as leaders in the smoke-free world. Uh, just the sheer fact that you're devoting resources to an issue provides legitimacy and establishes expertise. On top of that, compiling information from reputable sources speaks to your professionalism. You are the company you keep. Once you publish materials, you open up to the scrutiny of opposition, and when you create materials that can pass those tests, you gain the trust of the public. Also, others can cite your work and look to you for answers. Secondly, creating new materials compiles new information. Timely research can reveal new statistics, which can best illustrate an issue. And new information also might bring the issue home, highlighting local trends, local opinions, and facts. And thirdly, creating new materials communicates your issue in your words. You can build and control the message that frames the issue for the media and for the public. This is an important step of any community education work. You can use the opportunity to answer frequently asked questions and also counter misinformation that might be out there. In creating new materials, there are three main goals to reach for. We want to provide education, that is to provide information to yourself, to colleagues, and to the community. We want to do outreach, reach new audiences and ask them to get involved. And lastly, we want to empower communities to improve their environments. Best uses are proactive strategies to meet the goals of educating, empowering, and communicating the importance of smoke-free housing using the CSS Smoke-Free Housing Guide and AFI's Making Room to Breathe case study. We'll go over education strategies, outreach and recruitment tips, and community empowerment tactics. To educate communities, you might, for instance, hand out the guide or the case study at a community board meeting. Community boards are effective bodies to reach out to because they are community representatives. That's what they're there for. They are a gathering of neighborhood leaders, they're action-based, and they often have the ears of local politicians. 
So you might make an announcement at a community board's public session that a new case study or a new guide has been published, and then bring a few copies to leave at the information table. Also, you might schedule a meeting with your representatives and leave them a copy of both resources. You could also schedule a meeting with other decision makers like landlords or co-op boards to do the same thing, leaving them a copy of both. For tenants looking to bring smoke-free housing to your building, you could hand out the guide to neighbors at block parties or those you see on the stoop or in the park. You might be able to answer questions and concerns from those uh, you speak with using AFI's case study, uh, specifically in the tenant's perspective and uh, appendices sections to show what a potential change could look like. In recruiting support and reaching and involving new audiences, you can meet with relevant community board committees such as the housing or health or environmental committee and ask them to link the content on their website and provide copies in their offices. You might invite a legislator to attend an event which features the material, uh, the new resources, or the issues that it covers. Since it's easy to read quickly, start with the guide as a tool to talk to neighbors and see who is open and supportive of the issue. Find your allies. And lastly, to empower communities to improve their environments, use both resources to open dialogue about passing a community board resolution supporting smoke-free housing. You can use the case study's key lessons and recommendations as a tool to motivate building management to make the transition. And as a side note, sample materials in the appendices of the case study can make it very easy. The blueprint's already there. Use momentum started by handing out the guide and set up a follow-up talk or a group meeting with supportive neighbors to discuss potential next steps in more detail. Both the CSS guide and AFI case study can be very helpful tools. So I'm gonna share ways that both can be helpful for both community-based organizations and health organizations, and then for uh, individual tenants and landlords. Starting with the CSS guide, the aim of this guide is to empower New York City residents with information and resources to create healthier homes by making them free of secondhand smoke. Some of, some of the ways that it may be helpful for health and community-based organizations specifically are providing it to community members who contact your organization for help, adding the guide to materials of any health-based work you're already doing, integrating the guide into materials or compiled material packets, especially those focused on air quality, filtering and ventilation, or apartment re rehabilitation, for example. And lastly, educating rent-stabilized tenants on what to and also what not to ask for when bringing smoke-free policies to their buildings for an easier transition with less drama. Some ways that the CSS guide may be helpful for tenants and property owners specifically are making conversations easier with neighbors. It also provides clarity for some frequently asked questions and rent stabilization rules. And it introduces the topic and provides data to management, landlords, co-op or condo boards to support your case for voluntary smoke-free policies. Next, the AFI case study describes several steps AFI undertook to document the levels of knowledge and interest concerning smoke-free housing among community residents they serve, as well as piloting smoke-free housing policies in two of their affordable housing developments. Ways that the case study may be helpful for health and community-based organizations specifically are Sending to or bringing with you to meet with legislators, for instance, those on the Housing Committee and the City Council. Using the testimonies in the Tenants Perspective section to su show support for smoke-free housing. And empowering constituents and organization members to adopt detailed, effective policies. Ways that AFI's case study may be helpful for tenants and property owners are using sample materials in the appendices to outline your own smoke-free policy, using the key lessons and recommendations section as a blueprint for an easy transition, and using AFI as a resource and a contact and also the case study for a resource 
for common questions such as how do you go about building consensus on this issue? Lastly, I'd like to go over strategies to promote these and your own content by talking about media outreach, informational displays, group presentations, and individual contact. All of these strategies apply to both the CSS guide and the AFI case study. They can also be used for any content and any resources that you have and your organization has created. When you're working with the media to promote your new content, you can write a letter to the editor explaining that you've learned something new from or found helpful the guide or case study. You can write a blog post or share someone else's blog post. If you have the resources, you might want to buy an ad in a newspaper. Many college papers are also free or low cost, so that might be an area you go to. And host a news conference to unveil, unveil a new report and invite VIPs to the event. Another important part of media outreach is social media. The social media outreach has an added benefit of increasing website and social media account traffic for all your work. When working with social media, you can take a photo and uh, add events with materials distribution and share on all your social media accounts. You can create photo memes to promote reports and guides. You can tweet the link to the release of materials. You can create your own subcontent with the materials, and I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. For example, instead of posting on Facebook just a resource with a line like something like, check it out, you can comment on how that new content resonates with the work you're doing, or you can highlight a particularly impactful quote or statistics. To do this, you'll help connect your organization's particular membership with the content and it will resonate with readers of your post better. For instance, NYPIRG is a student-directed organization, so I would write something like, I'm amazed that I read in CSS's Smoke-Free Housing Guide that 200,000 children are regularly exposed to smoke at home. That's nearly more than the total CUNY undergraduate enrollment in total. Setting up informational tables or or displays can be another great tactic. You can target your organization's constituency and set up a display with materials and background information with colorful visuals at relevant events. You can also drop off resources at community board meetings at their public information tables. And if you have a common area in your building, you can place resources there or in housing management offices. Giving group presentations is an excellent way to reach a large audience in a short amount of time. You can give presentations at community board meetings or at your own or other organization's events, for instance. And lastly, by contacting individuals, you can add your own personal touch and also really target your communication. You can mail or email the resource with a cover letter and then follow up with a call to make sure they received it and to answer any potential questions that may have come up. You can do this with legislators, community boards, editorial staff of newspapers, and potential partner or ally organizations such as tenants' rights groups or legal aid societies. Thank you so much for listening, and good luck with your work on smoke-free housing. Thanks again to our partners with Asian Americans for Equality, the Community Service Society of New York, and the New York Public Interest Research Group. All of the resources discussed today are available at our website, www.nycsmokefree.org.